And so we're going to be diving into Esther and Job. Um, any of you here tonight, just out of curiosity, and I'm not going to test you, but anybody here tonight, how many, or out of all of you that are here tonight, how many of you uh, just in your head know the story of Esther? You know kind of what that story is all about. I'm just trying to get a feel here. A few of you, okay. Uh, it's probably not a book that a lot of people read. You know, it's just, I mean, it's in the Old Testament. A lot of people don't even go to the Old Testament too much. That's why we're, we're here. Um, but uh, I, let me ask you this. How many of you know the story of Job? See, most all of you, you know. And so that's one where, um, just so you know, you're probably not going to have warm fuzzies, okay? Uh, now, it's, a, it's actually a remarkable book. It's a... Uh, uh, I know when it comes to suffering and people grieving and going through very, 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 very dis, uh, uh, difficult situations in their life, Job is a book that we go to a lot because it teaches us a lot about that. So those are the two books we're going to look at tonight. I'm going to open this up with a word of prayer, uh, and then we're going to dive in. So let's pray together tonight. Father, thank you for uh, this moment that we have tonight to gather together. Uh, to come here, Lord, as those who uh, love you and uh, worship you and, and just adore you, God. And, and, Lord, we're so thankful for your presence in our life. We're thankful, God, that, that Lord, you saved us by the, by the blood of Jesus, by your grace through our faith in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. You have saved us. And, Lord, we're thankful for salvation. We're thankful for sanctification. God, we're thankful that uh, the day we're saved is not, uh, is not the finish line. But God, it's the beginning of, of spiritual growth in our life. And God, we thank you for how your Holy Spirit just convicts and encourages and, and teaches us so that we can mature in our faith. And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that, that we have your word to turn to, to to learn more and more every time we read about who you are. Because God, this, this story is not about us. It's about you. And so Father, we thank you for your word and what it teaches us about who you are. And God, we thank you for your word that, that teaches us who we are. That we can understand, Lord, where uh, life change needs to happen. And God, I, I pray that as, as we read Scripture and as we study together, Father, that we would be obedient to always take your word and apply it to our own life as necessary. God, we love you so much, and I thank you for every person that's gathered here tonight. And God, it's just so wonderful to, to, to gather with a group of people who say, we want to study your word, God. We want to know more about uh, you. And so, Father, we just ask that you be with us tonight. Uh, Lord, for those that have some uh, situations in their life right now, unspoken prayer requests and all that, God, you're, you're so aware of all of that. So, Father, we lift up those up to you tonight as well. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight, uh, as I've already said, we're looking at two totally different books, Esther and Job. Both books are very interesting in their own right, and... Uh, I do want to say they're not tied together. A lot of the books that we've looked at already in the Old Testament, the reason we combine these books is because there was a common thread. Like last week we were looking, and Ezra was the author of all those books. And so as we look at Scripture, we, uh, we see these common threads. And so I sort of bring those together, okay? Um, but what, uh, what we have here tonight, these aren't tied together in any sort of way. But they both have uh, some very interesting sort of dynamics about them that, that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight that I think is really, really interesting. And, uh, and just to fit it all into our schedule, that's, why, that's one of the reasons. I probably would just do these separate, but, but that's why we're combining them tonight. Hopefully we can press through and, and get it done. So let's look first at Esther, okay? And so we're looking here. And as always, I want to sort of start off by offering to you some primary information, sort of background information, if you will, just so you understand this. Um, one of the things that, that we don't know about Esther is, is who the author is. Um, 
which is really much like a lot of the others. I mean, you know, for a lot of these Old Testament books and letters, we have to sort of, you know, we can, we can make an educated guess. We, we can have our suspicions about who wrote it because we see similarities in this and other writings that we know they wrote. And so there's, there's certain times where we can look at Scripture and, and have a pretty educated guess of who, who wrote it. But this is one where we really don't have um, a, a really good understanding of who might have, have written this book. Now, many people believe that uh, Mordecai, who is one of the figures that we're going to be looking at tonight, many people sort of point to him and say, well, I, you know, he, he, probably, he probably wrote this. And, um, and others believe that, uh, you'll never guess this, but Ezra might have written it, um, or Nehemiah might have written it. So there's a lot of different people sort of lobbying for different authorship when we look at this book. But any of those people would have been very familiar with the times. They would have known the circumstances that are going on. And they would have also understood very clearly the Persian culture. And so they would have, they would have known. Remember, rem, excuse, that, boy, that, did you hear that? It just, you know, I, don't, I got stuck and I just couldn't get out of it. So anyway, many of you remember that Israel was in exile, right? You remember, you know, we, we, we saw, we ended in kings, and they, off they go to exile. They've been, you know, they're, they're taken away, so they're in exile. And all these books that we're, re, we're, that we're seeing, these writings go back to those other times, but in some of these writings, it's talking about the, the actual return of those who were in exile. Now, Esther is not one of those who have returned. In fact, she's still in Persia. And so here we have this situation where she's still under the oppression of a king that uh, is, is not part of Israel, and there's where she lives. And, and, and so uh, the, whoever wrote this would have had a really good understanding of what's happening in that area, of what's happening in the culture and how they behaved as they, you know, lived their life back then. Um, the time frame... Uh, of when this was written, like so many of the others that we're going to be looking at from here on out, was somewhere around 400 B.C. Could have been 450, could have been 350, okay? But somewhere in that range, this is, this is where we are. And there's, there's really four major figures that we're going to look at, four major people that we're going to be looking at tonight, okay? Now, there's other people. You'll see other names in, in any of these books. I try to point out to you the main characters of the story you know who as we look at this story who are the people what's the story really all about and who is it really talking about and so here we have Esther obviously she's the main character if this was a if this was a movie she'd be the what do you call it the the what the lead star whatever you know she'd have she'd be the lead actor um you have Mordecai and Mordecai was uh a second cousin but quite honestly, he was more like an uncle or a father because he was he had sort of adopted her into his family, and so there. But there's a relationship. There, you know, they have a relationship. This uh, this cousin slash you know uncle. She, I mean, his second cousin, but but it's more like an uncle to her. Um, then you have King Asherus or Exerce. How you say that? Exerce. I can't. I have a real Xerxes. Yeah, something like that. X, you know, King X, uh, you have him, and, uh, and then you have a guy named Haman, okay, yep, H-A-M-A-N, Haman, or Haman, or, you know, I don't know, he might correct us today, Haman, yeah, something like that. So you have these guys, these are really kind of the four, the four people we're going to talk about tonight, because really the whole story sort of wraps around these individuals. And so as we look at this book, one of the things that we also like to throw out there, just to give you a bit of understanding before we dive into the Scripture to help you understand it, is to try to allow you the opportunity to understand the purpose behind this letter. What is, what is this letter going to teach us? And here's, here's the purpose of this letter, or the, the plot, you might say. It's to show us that when the enemies of Israel come and try to destroy um, God's people, that God, through his sovereignty, protects his people 
and destroys his enemies. Now, this is something that is a common thread throughout the Old Testament. This isn't the last, I mean, the first time we've seen this, this is something that we see. But when you look at this story that we're going to be looking at tonight, um, this, is, this is one of those stories where we really see some protection on God's people because they are at the point where literally they could have been eliminated from the face of the earth. Okay? This is a critical moment for Israel. It's a very critical moment in their life. And so this is where we really begin to understand, man, God really does love his people, right? This is where we really begin to understand, man, God is watching over his people. And God will not only uh, judge his enemies, but he will smite his enemies, right? He will destroy them. And so we're going to we're going to sort of see that unfold. Also, and this is interesting, the book of Esther records the institution of the Feast of Purim. And it's P-U-R-I-M. That's one of your blanks, I think. The Feast of Purim. And the obligation that the Jewish people, the, the Hebrews there, the obligation that they would have to observe it annually to commemorate the deliverance of the Jewish nation through Esther. And here's what you need to know about this. They still celebrate this to this day. this, This story is very important to Israel. It's It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal. Okay, They still celebrate this this feast to this day. Now, I told you that both of these books are very interesting because they have a little, a, a little nuance to them. Both of them offer something a little bit different than kind of other writings. Here's the, new, here's the little interesting note about Esther. You ready? Nowhere in this book, not one time, is God mentioned. You won't find it. He's not mentioned. And yet, you read this book and you learn so much about God. It's unlike any other book. That's, that's the interesting part of it. It's, he's not mentioned there. You read the story of these people. But what happens is, through this story, and here's, here's where this becomes so important. You know, we've gone through the Old Testament, right? We, we know how God works. We know that God loves his people. We know that he protects them. We know that he gives them second and third and fourth chances. We know a lot about God. And through all these books, they've declared to God be the glory, right? And so here when we read this story, we don't really even have to have God mentioned here because we just know this couldn't happen without God. And so you're going to see the story of God's sovereignty unfolded or unveiled in this thing. But this is a neat thing, a neat little thing about this book is that God's not even mentioned in it. Now, here's what I want to say about Esther. The book can be divided into three parts, okay? Three different parts. Let me give you the parts, then we'll go back and we'll dive into it a little bit. So the first part is this is that Xerxes, or King Xerxes, hey, I, why can't I say that? Country boy. That's what it is. Did you? You watched 300, didn't you? <laughs> All right, so anyway, Xer, Xerxes, right? Xer, Xer, Xer. I'm just not spartan enough i guess to to say it but anyway my parents taught me country boy that's all i got that's all i can bring you but anyway um king x here uh what we see here is his queen and i'll try to say her name vashti right okay queen vashti is killed she kills her and ends up taking esther as his new queen. So this is the first part of the book. This is, of the three parts, this is the first part we're going to be looking at. The second part is this, is that Mordecai 
faces his enemy, which is Haman, okay? And so Haman is the enemy of Mordecai, whom he overcomes, okay? So they, they, uh, Haman is the loser here. He's the enemy of God, and he loses. So we're going to see that as sort of the second part of this story. And then the third part is the reality that Israel is delivered from the hand of their enemy by the sovereignty of God, and, uh, and Esther establishes this feast of Purim, okay, P-U-R-I-M. She establishes this. She institutes this. She declares it law to celebrate this every single year because it is so important that they remember that they remember that this is the deliverance of Israel, right? So this is a powerful book. So let's, let's kind of back up here. Let me kind of walk through this. So Esther's story is one of those that has all the elements of a great movie. We just mentioned 300, you know. But, um, but this is a story that, that really, uh, as you read through it, 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 it's got a lot of interesting things that go on, interesting figures. You see these people who are, who are just really... Uh, really interesting characters. And then it also comes with some strange twists, okay? But the story begins with King X requesting his queen, Vashti, to show herself. She's a person of beauty. And so what he does is he summons her to come into his court. He's having a, a festival. He's having a celebration, a feast, and in fact, he was a man of many feasts. I think there's seven different feasts recorded in the book of Esther. But he, 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 he summons her. He calls her to come. Now, here's the law that you need to understand. For in, in, in their culture, the queen never approached the king without being summoned. The queen was always to stay in her place, in her court, unless she was summoned by the king. So she doesn't come. But when summoned, you come. You don't waste time. You come. And, you know, I mean, this is kind of the relationship that me and my wife. No, I'm <laughs> She's not here, so I can pick on her, right? This is not at all how our relationship is. But, uh, but this is the relationship that they, I mean, this is the culture there. And so the law says never approach the king unless he summons. And if he summons, then you come. And so what happens is she's in her court. She's having her own feast. She's got all the women folk over there. And here they are having their big party. And he says, you know what? My wife is so beautiful. I want to show her to y'all. And so he summons her to come. He's, he's going to show off his bride. But she knows what the deal is. And for whatever reason, she refuses to come. Now, he's intoxicated. He's uh, partying pretty hard, and his anger grows. And ultimately, it angers him enough to where he says, if I don't kill her, every person in this world will lose respect for me. And so he does away with her. And then he sobers up, and he realizes he doesn't have a queen. My gosh, I killed my bride. <laughs> what a party, right? Right? I mean, he's in this, I mean, he just kind of sobered up and he, he realizes that, you know, she's no longer around. And, and so he seeks some advice, like, what am I going to do now? I don't have a queen. And, and, and so uh, the, the idea to have a beauty pageant is presented to him. Here's what we'll do. We'll take 400 of the most beautiful girls in the land. And we'll bring them in here. And we'll give them a year to prepare themselves, and then we'll have this beauty contest. And then you can choose who you would call as your next queen. And so they do that. Now remember, I mean, you just do what the king says. I mean, no, this is not, this is not a great plan for, for life today by any means, but this is what was happening in the Scripture. And Esther is one of those who is of great beauty. She's a, she's, she's a beautiful young lady, and so she becomes part of this group that's being presented to the king. And so she comes, and she, she's there, and she is uh, presented to the king. And, um, and what happens is Esther wins the beauty contest. She's the one that is selected as the next queen. 
Now, if, if you read the story, you'll see that it's not just her beauty. It's also her humility. It's, it's, a, it's, it's who she was as a person just as much as it was her beauty. But she's the one who selected. I want to read this to you tonight, uh, starting in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Read this with me, if you will. Uh, hopefully, you've already turned there. Um, but, but here's what it says. Sometime later, King Asherah's rage had cooled down. And he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decided against her. In other words, he killed her. And the king's personal attendants, they suggested, let, us, let a search be made for a beautiful young virgin for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in each providence of his kingdom so that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem at the fortress of Susa. Put them under the supervision of Haggai, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women, and give them the required beauty treatments. Then the young women who pleases the king will become queen instead of Vashti. This suggestion pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Now skip down to verse 16. We'll keep reading here. And it says, She was taken to King Asherus in the palace in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, and the king loved Esther more than all of the other women, she won more favor and approved from him than did any of the other virgins. And he placed that royal crown on her head and made her queen in place of Vashti. And the king held a great banquet for all of his officials and staff, and it was Esther's banquet. I mean, this is a, a, a situation where you look at this and you say, man, this is a, it's kind of weird. It's, kinda, it's, it's one of those stories that has these weird twists to it, and it's, it's a little dynamic. But, but what you need to understand, whether you read the story and you, you think this is the right approach or not, what you need to understand is that this is God's sovereignty working through a bad situation. And we know that because we begin to see it unfold as we read the story and we continue to read because what happens next is another critical part of the story. You see, this isn't the end of it. This, is, this isn't really even the beginning. This is what's unfolding. And, and you've got to wonder, as you look at this story, what, what Esther would have thought about even being the queen. But there she is. She's made queen. But what we begin to see in the second part of the story is what I've already shared with you, that Mordecai faces an enemy, Haman, and he overcomes this enemy. Let me tell you how that comes about. So Mordecai was the second cousin to Esther, this adoptive uncle, right? And so there was a very close relationship there. But Mordecai was a guy who was held in high favor, you know, there. He was, he was, a, he was a Jew. He was Hebrew. He was part of Israel, and, but he was, he was held in high favor, and he, he had served the king well. So the king was appreciative of his work. But the king had a very close friend, this Haman, this guy, who was not of royalty, but he certainly acted as though he was. And what he required of everybody because of his, his relationship with the king is that when he walked into a room or into a a courtyard or whatever, that everybody that was in his presence would bow to him. He wasn't the king, but that's what he expected. And everybody bowed to him because of the relationship that he had with the king. And so as they would walk in, they would bow. But there was one person who would not bow to him, and his name was Mordecai. This is the second cousin of Esther. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't sit too well with him, and he became very angry with Mordecai. And, the, and, and he finally gets to a place where he decides that not only is he going to kill Mordecai, do away with Mordecai, but he's also going to kill all those who are relative to him or all of his people. In other words, he's going to eliminate Israel off the face of the earth. And he has such high standing, he just figures he can get away with it. And so all of this is beginning to play out. And he decides he's going to take Mordecai's life. And Mordecai finds out about this. He finds out that this is the plan that's sort of set in place. 
And as you can imagine, he became fearful. He began to mourn. He began to cry. He, began to, he, he was sort of unnerved by this plan, hearing that not only was he going to die, but all of his people were going to die. And so he goes to Esther. And as he goes to Esther, he says, you got to do something. You're the queen. And she's like, you got to be out of your mind. If I go to him, I break the law. Because I'm not supposed to go to him unless he summons me. Same applied for her as it did Vesti, right? So, I mean, there's no, the, the law is the law. You don't go to the king with your problems at all. And he, he continues to try to help her understand that if you don't do this, we're all going to die. This is going to be the end of us. And Mordecai, Morde, Morde, I'm mortified. Mordecai, he was probably mortified. Mordecai gets to a place where he says, he says, you've, you've got to do this. And so at first, you know, she's, she's resisting. She's like, this, this can't happen. She refuses, but then this happens. In chapter 4, starting with verse 15, we see this. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. She says, go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, listen to this. After that, I will go to the king even if it's against the law. Listen to this. And if I perish, I perish. Is that bravery or what? Is that courage or what? And you gotta you gotta look at her and you gotta say, Man, I, I so respect this this woman named Esther. It says here in verse 17, so Mordecai, he went and he did everything that Esther had commanded him. But here's the reality. I told you a while ago that nowhere in this book is God mentioned. Nowhere do we see the Lord or God or Yahweh or anything like that. But what we do see is a woman of faith. Because what is the first thing she says to do? Fast and pray. Here's a woman who I can only imagine that she probably thought this was the end of her life. But she also realized that if something didn't happen, if something wasn't done, then they were all going to lose their life. And the courage, this is a young woman, the courage that she must have had had to have been strong, but more importantly than that, the faith that she had in God. To be able to say to Mordecai, and if I perish, I perish. Man, if you can't respect that, if you can't see the faith that she had in her God, man, that's powerful. And so Haman, he... Uh, she, she goes to him, make a long story short, obviously this, you know, you, you're going to have to read all this to, to get it. But he, she, she goes and she petitions the king. And as, in a series of events, Haman begins to lose favor with the king. And to make a long story short, ultimately the king ends up killing Haman and justice prevails. It's a powerful story. I'm leaving a lot of detail out just for the sake of time. We don't have time for But it's a powerful story. And I hope you'll go back and read it because it teaches us so much about who God is. 